Shabbat Shalom. It is hard to keep up with everything going on in the world. Uh, we have more means of communication than ever, but that also means that sometimes different things will slip through the cracks. I may be uh, enmeshed in different news stories or uh, following other people's posts, but occasionally uh, my, my wonderful wife will bring my attention to something that I otherwise might have missed as she uh, continues in some of the other corners of the internet to uh, bring things to my attention. Uh, this last week, a story came up uh, on the Kosher Food Group. Uh, this is one of those Facebook groups where people will share uh, insights or tips and especially restaurant recommendations uh, for kosher eating wherever you might be. Uh, we've been using it extensively to plan for our next trip to, uh, to England, uh, hoping to enjoy some of the good kosher cooking in London. But this week, there was an unusual post that got a lot of attention and unfortunately, not all of it what it should have been. Somebody posted to the group saying that they were uh, interested in opening up a kosher restaurant in Uganda, and they were looking for advice and information and some, you know, just general guidance on this topic. A kosher restaurant in Uganda. You know, Africa. Well, as quizzical as some of you look, Unfortunately, many of the people behind the keyboards on the other end of that group decided to type out their queries in unkind and unflattering ways. What kind of nonsense is that? You want to have a kosher restaurant in Uganda? What's the point? Why would you want a kosher restaurant in Uganda? Who in Uganda wants or needs a kosher restaurant? Is this some kind of scam? Yes, welcome to the Jewish world. The person explained, uh, and the moderator uh, investigated to confirm, that they are, in fact, a part of the Abu Yudaya community. And if you are not familiar with the Abu Yudaya community, then you have missed me mentioning them during other adult education and different sermons. And I'll bring you back up to speed very quickly. The Abu Yudaya community is a Jewish community in Uganda that converted en masse under the auspices of the conservative movement uh, now for 30 years ago or so. Uh, I had the great pleasure of uh, being neighbors to the first member of their community who came to the US to have smicha, to become a rabbi in the conservative movement. And that was an amazing experience. He said the hills of uh, Bever Beverly Hills looked an awful lot like the hills of Uganda. Uh, they just have a lot better sprinkler systems in Beverly Hills. But the untreated hills were very similar to home, he said. And so it was explained to the group this is somebody from the Abu Yudaya community. This is a Jewish community that chose as a group, there's a whole long story behind why they chose, but we can talk about that another time, to become Jewish. Therefore, yes, it's absolutely legitimate and appropriate and laudable that they are trying to expand their Jewish services beyond just a, a synagogue and school and the other bedrock of a Jewish community, but they want to also open up Jewish kosher restaurants. To which people responded, Oh, well, if they, conser they, they converted under the conservatives, then they're not really Jewish anyway. OK. Clearly, it was done entirely because of this week's Torah portion. Uh, sorry, the Haftorah, I should point out. What in the world am I talking about? Why would the Haftorah and this particular section line up? Well, you might have missed it with the beautifully smooth but unhelpful translation from uh, the Jewish Publication Society that is used for the Haftorah. The opening line of this Haftorah is not a statement, but a question, a question demanding an answer. Are you not to me like the Kushite? Kushite? What's a Kushite? All right, we've got a thousand different names of ancient people throughout the Bible. Are we expected to know all of them? Yes, you are. You can even go to the map in the back of the books if you want to look up of where these people lived. Uh, it's like page 15, 1513, 1, 14, 15. They didn't actually number the maps. It's a little frustrating, but that's the zone that'll take you in the back of the Chumash. Who are the Kushites? Ethiopians. Ethiopians, right? Ethiopians. You might know them better if you pay attention to the beginning of the Megillah, where it says that the king of Persia, Ahasuerus, ruled from Hodu to Kush from India to Kush, to Ethiopia. Kush was considered to be uh, sort of the 
far reach into the southern part of the known world uh, of the, uh, the ancient Near East at the time, the same way that Tarshish was the far edge of the western known world, uh, usually uh, uh, attributed to being Spain. So Kush was a distant land that was well known, but not exactly well traveled. You didn't get a lot of people coming by just casually from Kush in any time, and Israel didn't have a whole lot of relationship with them. But the verse doesn't end with just, are you not the same to me as those of Cush? The verse goes on to say, and did I not not only take you out of Egypt, but I also helped the Philistines come from Kaftor, and I helped the Arameans come from here. Philistines and Aram. Who are these folks? Who are the Philistines? Hmm? They were our biggest enemy. Yeah. Right, during the time of the judges, and then especially during David's reign, the Philistines were our huge enemy living in the coastal plain. Uh, in modern day Israel, it would be uh, around Gaza and Ashkelon, that section of the, uh, of the coast. And Goliath, who I think you all know, he was a Philistine. Okay, that's, that's who we're talking about here. And God is saying, are you not also like the Philistines? And are you also not like Aram? Now, Aram is a little bit less famous. It is up in what is now modern-day Syria. Uh, Aram was another rival-ish uh, community. But in, uh, uh, interestingly, in this particular passage, it is not talking about them in that rivalry. It is talking about God bringing them out of Kir the same way that he brought us out of Egypt. And this is indeed a prophecy that Aram, who is eventually taken over by the Assyrian Empire, keep up with the names if you can, that they too will eventually be redeemed from the Assyrians and be able to return home. That the, the, that the, the nation of Aram is not done for. They, will, they have a future in front of them, the same way that we had a future ahead of us out of Egypt. All right, so we've got the Kushites, we've got the Pelishtim, the Philistines, and we have the Arameans, Aram. Why is Amos, in his prophecy from, from Adonai, why is he demanding us to answer that question? Well, first of all, what is the answer that we're supposed to give? Right? Are you not, to me, just as the Kushite? What is the answer meant to be there? Yes. Yes. The Kushite, the Israelite, we're the same in the eyes of God. Are we not just like the Philistines? Are we not just like the people of Aram? The answer again is meant to be? Yes. yes. Again, unfortunately the JPS translation removes that question as part of the rhetoric and leaves it just, you are. I believe the question was intended to be a question in order to force an answer from those who hear this prophecy. That you cannot just say, I'm being described, you must admit in your heart that you understand what Amos is trying to preach. But does it need to be said three times? Do we need to be told three times that there are people that God also looks after? Couldn't God have just said, you know, you're not the only people on the planet. Why three and why these three? Why not mention the people of Tarshish? Why not mention the, the Babylonians? Why not mention some other groups? Well, because each one of these three represent a different category of person that we are most likely to be alienated from for superficial reasons. The Kushite is the most obvious. Why might we be alienated from the Kushite? Because they don't look like us, right? Because in the biblical time, the vast majority of Jews would have looked like every other ancient Near Easterner, and the vast majority of Kushites, those people from Ethiopia, or what modern day would be called Ethiopia, would not have looked the same in general facial structure and general skin color. There, there would have been a cosmetic difference between the two groups. By refer referencing the Kushite, Amos is saying, do you think God picks favorites based upon skin color? Do you think God picks favorites based upon the shape of their nose, on the style of their hair? No, not at all. God did not give you, Israel, special status because of your skin color, and God did not degrade anyone else because of their skin color. You, 
and the Cushite are equal in the eyes of God. That one's fairly simple, although, as I mentioned from the discussion on the board, there are still many modern Jews who miss that point. Hopefully they were in shul this weekend, and hopefully they were hearing this Haftarah, and hopefully they actually answered that question correctly, understanding that we and the Kushite are the same in the eyes of God. And then they can get to the two that are much harder, the Philistine. OK, fine, yes, we're the same as everyone else. We don't have racial typing. We, we believe that we are all one human family. But the Philistines? I mean, honestly? I mean, the Philistines were such a hated enemy of the Jews that when the Romans decided to poke a finger in our eye for having rebelled just one too many times, they renamed the territory Palestinia in order to offend us by naming it after a long-defeated enemy. It, it, it is you know, as if somebody were to conquer the US and then call it the Confederacy, just as a way of trying to spite us by having renaming it for something that was one of the most implacable foes and most dangerous foes we ever faced. So why can God suddenly whip out this Philistines are just like you statement? I mean, how deeply offensive. So you don't get a free pass. Just because God gave us Torah doesn't mean we're automatically better than the Philistines. Right? We still have the capacity, capacity to be just as bad as the Philistines. Madison, is that what you were going for? Yes. Exactly. We have just the same capacity to be as bad as the Philistines. And now what's the corollary? And even if the Philistines are this bad, that doesn't stop them from being human beings in the sight of God. Yes, they are our enemy. Yes, they caused huge death and destruction within the Jewish people. But yes, they are also still God's children. They are still human beings. We can look at them and say, we must work harder to make sure we do not imitate their evil. But we also have to look at them and say, despite the evil that their nation is engaged in, they are still human beings. They are still just like us. Yes, their, their culture, their warfare is, is reprehensible to us, but that is superficial. That can stop any time. And we hope and pray that it will. And when it does, we should not look upon them as being the irredeemable Philistines that are never allowed to walk upon God's earth, that must be fully exterminated. No, as soon as they lay down their arms, as soon as they say, hey, you know what, Israelites, you do you, we do us, let's stop this war, we accept the peace. But that only happens if you are willing to continue to hold on to the humanity of them, even while you are fighting against them. The last one, I believe, is the hardest. Aram. We know the least about Aram because, you know, you have to go read many other parts of Tanakh in order to get a feel for them. But the specific choice of wording that Amos uses is, I think, very telling. That Aram will come from Kir. That God will liberate them. They will have their own exodus. Yetziat, not Mitzrayim, but Yetziat Kir. The exodus from Kir for the Arameans. Competitive victimhood. We look at the Arameans and say, oh, you think you've got it hard. Oh, sure, the Assyrians picked you up and moved you to Kir. Yeah, where are the tribes of northern Israel? They're all gone. We've got it much worse. When the Assyrians moved you, they moved you in one group to one place. They moved us all over their empire. Where will our children come back from? How will our people ever return? We don't even know who they are. They don't know who they are. They have been completely deserted dispersed and assimilated into the Assyrian Empire, and now, many years later, completely gone. At least you Arameans, you know where your people are. You're complaining? No. The miracle God will do for us is much greater because our suffering is much greater than yours. So sit down and shut up. I don't want to hear a complaint from you, Aram. 
because we know what suffering is. Your suffering, pff, very, very minimal on the hierarchy of suffering. You've noticed that for many people, suffering and victimhood is a competitive sport, right? That you have to out-suffer someone else. Someone says, oh, you know, my, my, my hip's been acting up. Your hip's been acting up. Let me tell you about my back. I had to have both, both hips replaced. I'm going in for vertebrae surgery tomorrow. I don't think I'll be able to walk ever again. My son, he's having trouble at school. Your son's having trouble at school. My son, let me tell you about his trouble. Or of course, as a group, Jews, we face anti-Semitism. Oh, you face anti-Semitism. Well, our people have faced much worse than yours. Or someone says, we have been persecuted and exploited. And Jews respond, oh, you've been persecuted and exploited. We've got 2,000 years on the clock before you even began the race of suffering. And we've got a Holocaust on top of that. Go ahead. Tell me about your misery, and I'll tell you why it doesn't count, because mine is worse. Here, let me show you the family tree that was extinguished in the Shoah. Helpful? No. Is it good to be aware of the pain and suffering of our own people? Of course. We must remember. We do remember. It is, to be Jewish is to remember. But must we also acknowledge the suffering of others? and recognize that their suffering does not take away from the compassion that we also want for ourselves, for the assistance that we hope will come to put an end to the suffering that Jews around the world continue to face. Yeah, there is enough compassion to go around. There is enough sympathy to cover all of the wounds of all people around the world. And if we fight, then all we are doing is going to perpetuate. Because the problems of one group cannot be solved at the expense of another group, or else it will simply perpetuate the problems. It'll be pushing it from one to the other and back again over and over again. There is no solution there. The only solution is to say, look, Aram, I know we've had our difficulties in the past, but you're right. I hope that your people will come home. It is terrible what the Assyrians did to you. You deserve justice, and you deserve peace, and you deserve your own place. And for them to then return to us and say, you know what, Israel, yeah, we've had trouble with you too. We fought our wars and battles. We got rid of that King Ahab for you, which, you know, was kind of on a bonus side. But we hope too that eventually your children will return, that eventually you, your people will live in peace, as almost predicts throughout the rest of the Haftorah. This is what it means to recognize that we are all created by the same God. That yes, sometimes we fight like the Philistines, sometimes we look different like the Cushite, and sometimes we resent or are jealous of someone else's attention that they are receiving that we think is at the expense of our own. But none of that matters. What matters is that we recognize that we are all brothers and sisters. If we fight and squabble, if we allow our jealousy and pettiness to get the better of us, then we are simply reliving Cain and Abel from the first section of the Torah for all eternity. That's the choice. Cain is told. Sin crouches at the door. That pettiness, that jealousy, that, that anger is sitting right there ready to dominate you. Give in to it, well, your brother dies. But if your brother dies, that doesn't make your life any better, as we see in the story of Cain. We must recognize we come from the same source, and we are all headed to the same destiny. The only thing that we have control over is how well we hold together in the journey in between. Almost in these few short verses, ask that question. Are you different than the Cushite, the Philistine, the Aramean? The answer is no. They're my brother. Shabbat Shalom.